Good morning, everybody. Morning. Morning. You all awake? Yeah. All hungover? Just kidding. Um, so anyways, I'd like to welcome DC217's very own Wendy Edwards. A little bit about her. She's a developer interested in data science. Uh, she is a SANS 2017 recipient of uh, Women's Academy, uh, NASA Data Knot, and uh, she's also a recipient of the Dan Initiative Scholarship. Um, and one of the scholarships, I think, for the period track. Yeah, SummerCon. SummerCon, summer sorry, SummerCon. Sorry. Uh, anyways, uh, round of applause to introduce our speaker. <laughs> sorry about that. Okay, so the title of the, my talk is Who's Tracking Your Body? And we're talking about health apps and health and uh, possibly some medical devices and your privacy. So let's start with the, the health apps. So health apps, um, there's a lot of them. Um, how many of you have ever used a health app? Um, are you guys still using it? Okay. So health apps can really encompass a whole lot of things. I mean, um, fitness, uh, fitness, uh, diet and nutrition, you know, like you, your calorie counters, um, stuff that reminds you to take your medication. Um, basically, period trackers are a big one. In fact, we looked at, the, at some of those for SummerCon, uh, and there are a whole lot of those, and those are, so, those are actually some of the most uh, popular health apps. And there are also things related to uh, specific medical conditions and devices, such as uh, CPAP, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. And there are also uh, mood and mental health trackers. So what kind of data is I going to give you? It's going to maybe give you your diet and exercise habits, your weight and your BMI. Um, stuff, for example, like a uh, woman's ovulation, their periods, are they trying, are they trying to conceive? I um, mean, what, what medication is somebody taking? And um, maybe, maybe also like certain kinds of health conditions, like for example, um, if you're using a CPAP app, you probably have apnea. So question, um, has anybody ever shared information with an app that you maybe wouldn't want to talk about with the person sitting next to you? Okay. Cause like, yeah, cause like if you think about it, um, would I like to announce my weight right here? No. But people are pretty comfortable putting it into, it's not unusual for people to be willing to put it into an app. So you might think, so, okay, so apps have privacy policies, right? So, um, great, they have privacy policies, um, but how, has anybody ever actually tried to read an app's privacy policy? Oh my gosh. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, okay, how many people have found it easy to understand an app's privacy policy? Okay, like not. So the, the New York Times did this really under, um, interesting study. They used uh, something called the Lexile framework that measures uh, reading levels. And they found that the privacy policies, they were very dense, not very readable, and they were pretty much above the reading level that you would um, expect of an average college student. So just interestingly enough, the uh, GDPR, the EU's GDPR requires um, concise, transparent, and intelligible form using clear and uh, plain language. And that's, that's in a sense, kind of interesting. Um, so what, is, what should readable mean? I mean, um, I mean has any, um, how many of you have looked at, say, an internet comments, comments section? And you see a bunch of adults who seem to read at a fifth grade level? Yeah. <laughs> like, so does readable mean that the, that, that those people should be able to understand it. Does it mean that like an average college grad should be able to understand it? What does it mean? Uh, that's and that's still pretty unclear. So basically, where does the data go? And these are these are a couple of examples. Um, so for our SummerCon project, we took a look at ten popular period uh, tracker apps, and all of them were communicating with at least one tracker. One of them was, one of them actually was uh, communicating with, I think, up to 19 sites identified as, track, as uh, tracking sites. That one kind of won our prize. And there was another uh, well-published uh, study by uh, Grundy that was published in uh, the BMJ Journal. They looked at 24 health apps, which were mostly not period trackers, and they found that 19 of them shared uh, 
user data with it with um, entities that would be considered trackers. Uh, yeah. So generally we're talking about like um, advertising or something that uh, like an analytics thing that tracks user behavior in the site. So I have basically whether it's specifically ad or whether it's um, something called whether they talk about it being analytics. Um, I believe those are both considered trackers. Uh, if you all have a question, can you please use the microphones to start recording the talk? No worries. No worries. And there have been, and those are those are just a couple of them, but there have been a number of privacy studies compare. Uh, on on these apps that confirm the same thing. I mean, there's been like for example, there's this year there's been a number of articles in the media talking about the uh, the behavior, the period trackers that pretty much came to the same conclusion we did. So um, one important concept in privacy is that you want the ability to keep different facets of your life. Um, separate. Like for example, um, you maybe wouldn't want to share with your employer the same things you share with your doctor. And perhaps you wouldn't bring your work performance reviews into your doctor to share with your doctor either. And so it's just keeping being able to keep separate aspects of your life separate. And so one of the issues with these trackers is they, t they tend to Identify. They tend to identify um, users in a way that so that it can be tracked across different apps. It's so it's not uh, just like this one app is creating an ID for you. They are creating an identifier that can be used across apps to start to uh, aggregate your data, and that's what people care about. So just these are just a couple of examples of how it's done. You've got a device fingerprint. Uh, I mean, they can use uh, your history, your device type information about your device. Um, sometimes I've heard them even using uh, the, the fonts that somebody has installed on their computer. And then there's also like for example in Android they have something called an, an advertising ID which is actually specific to the Android system not necessarily the individual app. Um, so um, are most of you familiar with what an IMEI is on a cell phone? It's something that uniquely identifies your, your phone. That is um, for example, Google prohibits that being used as an identifier, but a study uh, another study determined that some apps were still doing it. So actually, another way, so um, what if you want to just send your data directly to the uh, big, big uh, data warehouses? Um, I bring you single sign-on. <laughs> so like, I'm just like, I bet most of you have signed up to something through Google and Facebook, right? And so like the apps, the apps can ask Facebook to send a whole lot of data. I don't know if you're, you're when you sign on through Facebook, they say you get a bunch of permissions from Facebook asking you to send certain kinds of data. Like they want to, they want your uh, profile photo, they want your email address, they want all your friends so you, that they can connect you to them. Um, perhaps they want your firstborn child. And um, it is very, and users when users when they're looking at it, they're usually like yes 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 yes. I mean, um, users don't very often seem to say no. And so when when you when you do that, it's like uh, Google and Facebook. I, I mean, they're in the business of a, a, uh, aggregating data as a way they make money. So it's like your data is going right to them. Like so, for example, uh, a, a period tracker app. Um, it's like you're so you're telling um, Google that you're. Um, Probably that you're a you're a female. You're probably within a certain age range. Um, you might be interested in having a child, and they can tell that just for, just from the fact that you're using this app. So basically, uh, where does the where does the data go upstream? Um, so basically, sales and marketing is a very big thing. They want they want to to uh, be able to target advertising, um, analytics. Uh, so with analytics. Uh, basically, I mean, stuff that's measuring user behavior in a site and trying to figure out how well a site is working. Um, and, the, and the thing of it is, the data, um, all this data could be combined to, to create to uh, create kind of a bigger, to create a bigger picture of you when you start putting stuff together from across apps. Like you could say, um, somebody who's, uh, they've, got, they've, they've got a period tracker, or they've downloaded a Koran app, um, and they're hanging on at a job search site, they're probably a younger Muslim woman looking for a job, right? 
So, so put all this stuff together. And sometimes the data can go even further upstream to these, these things called data brokers. <laughs> so one of the things about the analytics, the analytics um, sites, they're kind of freemium sites, and they'll say they will provide the developers free metrics on how their sites is performing in exchange for access to the data. So, um, so, so uh, basically, so on Valentine's Day, there was a pretty good tweet, tweet that said, uh, "Roses are red, violets are blue. When the product is free, the product is you." So, I'm usually when there's a free free product, they are collecting some kind of data on you. So let's go. Let's say let's have a question because I've like you, you've heard from me long enough. Okay, so let's say buying data to help target individuals is common in higher budget campaigns, and and it is. Uh, let's say Carla candidate knows that her opponent's campaign is likely to be doing this. Um, should she, like, for example, she could, for example, um, maybe she wants to target people who uh, care, are likely to care about certain healthcare issues. So, um, should Carla buy and use this data, data to target likely voters, um, ethical or unethical? Okay, does it matter that her opponent is going to be doing the same thing and she's likely to be at a disadvantage if she doesn't? She needs to do it. That's not okay. Did the voters get permission? So a lot of the apps will actually, within the mule there's actually permission that they're allowing. And as you said, people can understand it, but allow allowed to give consent for that data to go to the third party. Yeah. already given or not you know, so, okay, so it very likely comes back to issues related to the privacy policies. I mean, that the, the user technically gave that, <clears throat> gave that permission, um, but <clears throat> could, they, could they read and understand the privacy policy? Probably not. So, you, so, so like, for example, like a, a user, um, let's say, so you have a, a fairly incomprehensible privacy policy. The user uh, couldn't quite understand it. Does that count as consent or not? In a lot of states, the um, driver license data and the voter rolls. Yeah, I'll use the microphone, sorry. Oh, yeah, we're, we're recording this stuff. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry, it's just a comment more than anything else. Uh, in a lot of states, the, the driver license information and the voter rolls are made available by the state. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. the information, and again, I put up unethical because to some extent it is unethical to to be using the data but it's it's not illegal to be using the data yeah and, that, and that's a very and that's a very important distinction and it, it's it's actually true uh, at least for example in illinois you're a you're a candidate or you're a party or whatever you can go buy people's voting records but what if you wanted to what if you wanted to Take it a step beyond their voting records. What if you wanted to to uh, take some of these personal data from the data brokers and combine it with their voting records to try to get a sense of what they cared about and how likely they were to vote for your candidate? Um, is does is that okay? No. Okay, so we so we got to know. So next question. A company wants to target bronies for a My Little Pony Band-Aid marketing campaign. Is it okay to buy personal data to do this? Uh, you... Oh, okay, Brony. Um... <laughs> <laughs> so, Bronies are like, um, very often like young adult males who like My Little Pony. So, for example, like let's say you wanted to you wanted to find um, these uh, young adult males that were likely to need band aids that had also expressed an interest in My Little Pony or bron brony groups to target for advertising. So, I'm taking that as a no. If they had joined. So, I think it all comes down to the conditions under which people are sharing their data, right? So, if they have joined a My Little Pony fan club 
uh, for brownies, and they're um, excited about the product line of the My Little Pony, they might be thrilled to receive an ad like this. And so I think it's really coming back to your central point, which is what are the terms and conditions under which these data have been collected? So if they've been collected um, under ethical terms and conditions, then it would, of course, be ethical to redistribute them as well as legal. Yeah, that's a good point. So we, so we have a, a couple of scenarios in which it might at least, like some people think that they're, that it might in some cases be ethical to use targeted data. And in fact, let's say if, if anybody can buy um, data from these uh, data brokers, um, how about an insurance company? Like if you can get this, all this big data that includes data from your health apps, um, should an insurance company be able to buy it? Okay. So no. Um, any comments on that? Yeah, I think the problem that you have if, is if they can access this kind of data, then it will probably directly influence uh, what your insurance rates are going to be. Are they going to target you for either known or unknown pre-existing conditions, et cetera? So I, I think that uh, gives them more knowledge than, than they're entitled to. Yes. I mean, I would, or at least I would personally agree with you. And, and interestingly, this is an area that's not regulated. This is a, currently a gap in policy and regulation in this law. Yeah, I mean, I know, like the FTC, FTC at some level regulates data brokers, but like, for example, so, the, so they're in the, the, you've got the big data broker sites that they're aggregating a whole bunch of information about people from uh, different sites. Who can they sell it to? Who can buy it? I don't think that's covered at all. Last question. This is a sh this is assuming that PHI is being exchanged um, to be able to target individuals. So most of the data, if not all the data, coming out of the health apps, um, it's a world I've lived in as a as a VC for the last eight years, um, is all an aggregate. So you can't really actually break it down granularly to actually because PHI can't be can't be exposed. It has been in a few instances, and that is illegal. But I guess to, for this to actually target and affect, and it's a great comment about pre-existing condition, you have to actually exchange PHI. Um, okay, so, so, so what's the basis here? Okay, or wh so what are we getting at? You're talking about PHI, and PHI is like a term under HIPAA, right? Right. And so the thing of it is, like an app developer, somebody sitting in their garage writing a uh, health app is not actually a covered entity covered under PHI, uh, covered under HIPAA. So it's like whether they are, um, ex so it's like, their, their handling of health information is just not covering it or HIPAA. They can do whatever they want. And so so it's, it's basically like there's this completely unregulated uh, source of data that can include health, health uh, sensitive health data. Um, should insurance companies be able to buy it, especially if anybody else can? Yeah? So isn't it incumbent, though, if, in this case, Blue Cross, the insurance company recognizes information they're buying is actually something under another standard would be HIPAA. It's the same information in a different category. Wouldn't that be incumbent upon them to follow the legal mandate that they're aware of, even though that app itself might not fall under that category? I, that's an excellent question. Um, and unfortunately, I am not an attorney and I don't play one on TV. So, <laughs> so he's right. So. The Talkspace example from New York um, about 18 months ago is a good example. They're not a covered entity. If you compare them to like Doctor On Demand or Ginger IO or one of those other companies who have actually a separate medical PC that's a covered entity um, that clearly falls under HIPAA, but um, it was pretty clear that, as you said, even the ones that aren't covered entities actually still fall under under HIPAA. In general, if you're if you're holding people's individual PHI, um, it still it still falls under that. I So I, I would say um, insurance companies are covered under HIPAA. Um, your developer, your am, your amateur developer uh, writing it writing an app is not. And I would say that your data brokers are probably not. So it's like so you're talking about like an insurance company potentially buying data that does contain PHI from something that's not covered. And that's that seems to be in fact pretty uncharted territory. It's not very well defined legally. 
this morning. I, if I get diagnosed by a doctor with something that I don't recognize, what's the first thing I do? I Google search it. I'm going to look it up. That Google search history is in the is in that history here. Get it from other sources, right? But it's not really going to end up in a PHI bucket. Uh, Google search history on one wouldn't you? Right. right. That's right. But I can identify the user and his past history of somewhat, right? I mean, using analytics and enough data. Oh yeah. I can f figure out what that user's past history of illness is before I judge him for allowing to, to ensure. Okay, so let's so let's uh, jump jump topics. Um, so sometimes, so basically, with Android apps, there are ways that you can basically reverse engineer them and modify them. Like, uh, for example, you can. Okay, somebody. Okay, like so, somebody could com conceivably like decompile um, the code, change it to do what they wanted, recompile it, and resign it just with Android Studio. Or they can even if they if you're talking about specific libraries, you can swap those out if you want. So, um, so what if somebody wanted to? Uh, they like the functionality of an app, and they wanted to take it and modify it. To enhance, to uh, improve your privacy, like they wanted to just uh, cut out all the stuff that was talking to trackers. So, good question. So, is it ethical to modify an existing app to increase your privacy? Like, you want to just take the some of the tracker stuff out? Is that ethical or unethical? Okay. Um, what about? What if you wanted to take this modified app that you'd, you'd this app you'd modified to uh, take out some of the the stuff that you felt compromised your privacy and you wanted to release that app to the public? Okay, not ethical. Maybe maybe ethical. <laughs> well, you know. So to me, it goes down to the basis of the research side. So if you're taking the code and you're making it available but not re-releasing re it as an app, then you're placing the ethics in the hands of anybody who may utilize it later. That's a, to that's profit a good off point. of it would be wrong in my book to put okay. down, hey, I modified it to do this. Your okay. mileage may vary. So, so like, what if you're not profiting off it, you're just putting out a version of the uh, app that you, without the problematic privacy, the stuff that you felt was an invasion of privacy? You're not profiting it off, it, off it at all? I personally don't see an issue with that. Okay. It comes back to terms and agreements. Again, it's this thing of people clicking through the, uh, mm -hmm. the agreement. Most, most software agreements have uh, a no reverse engineering clause in it. If you download the product, you are specifically prohibited from reverse engineering it. And if you do, if you do release the code, you're effectively it's 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 plagiarism. Whether where do you whether you're profiting from it or not, to some extent, is irrelevant. If you're using if you're publishing somebody else's copyrighted works, you're also breaking those copyright laws. Yeah. So again, it's 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 the difference between ethical and and the legality. And then another question is: You could say so the developer spends a lot of their time, a lot of hours of their time writing this code and these, and connecting it to these trackers is how they monetize it. So would you say do they deserve compensation for their for their effort? Yeah, I think the line on this really becomes a personal use issue as opposed to impact. It's a it's an intellectual property issue at this point. If you are tampering with the person who developed the app, if you're tampering with their perceived intent to make money or otherwise propagate the app, then that's unethical because it's an impact to somebody else. Okay, to put it in uh, simpler terms, okay, if I know if I know how to make the recipe for Heinz ketchup and I use it for myself, nothing wrong with that. I'm just using it for myself. If I go ahead and put it out on the market, then there's a problem with that or alter it in some way. Now, what I think is probably 
similarly ethical would be if you want to get out on a forum or something like that and be able to state so that people have a better understanding of what they're downloading when they download that app, then I would consider it, consider that also to be ethical. Okay. I'd be a little bit curious. So like what if you came up, what if you came up with a recipe, something that tasted, that was based on the Heinz recipe that tasted exactly like it, but it was maybe better for diabetics that had limited sugar tolerance. Could you put that out there? Then I think you better talk to your attorney to make sure you're not going to infringe on their patents. Okay. Well, th thank you very much. I, I think yeah. I'm not going to get into the ketchup making business just yet. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a lot. This is very similar to what Dana Lewis has done with the Open APS project. So she is a diabetes activist who hacked her um, insulin pump and then released the code of what she had done publicly, but didn't then say to people, oh, if you'd like to hack, you know, hack your pancreas, here's how you can do it. So it was a, an N of one activity, um, but with a uh, large impact um, broadly. Oh, that, sounds, that sounds actually really interesting. Does the, releasing the code invalidate the entire privacy agreement? What, so, how does how does that affect like just so I, I hadn't even meant it? I hadn't even meant releasing a code I had actually meant releasing it in a format that people could very that would make it very easy for people to install on their own devices because it's like like a lot of your smartphone users out there most of them are not developers so let's, let's say you just put out the APK you you modify it you take the privacy you take the things out that you think are an invasion of privacy and you put the uh, and you just put the APK out there um, so that it, yeah okay the that might get kicked out of the Google Play Store pretty fast, but you put the uh, APK out there so pretty much anybody with a smartphone can install it. Okay, but... I, uh, I didn't even meant... I, okay, yeah, I guess all agreements are off at that point, yeah. and people are just... Okay. Yeah. Thank you for the great comments. I feel like, I feel like these are making this... I feel like these are making this talk. Okay. So basically... Uh, <laughs> So, um, is anybody is, is anybody who's comfortable sharing? Is anybody familiar with a CPAP machine? Yeah. So basically, it's called a con um, it's called a continuous positive airway pressure, and it um, helps people with sleep apnea by delivering this uh, pressurized air. And so, like the CPAP devices, they're pretty high tech, and they collect a whole lot of data, like your usage, your mass leakage, your sleep interruptions. Um, and so, so the thing with the CPAP, the CPAP things is, is that that takes uh, surveillance from optional, like with with putting some of these apps on your phone to uh, mandatory, like as in uh, you will be sharing this data. So how they share it varies. Like for example, um, there's one like there's a ResMed Air Mini that uses uh, a Bluetooth connection and a smartphone uh, app to manage the data, but a lot of them now have these cellular wireless modems that automatically transmit data. And so they get basically sent to the device manufacturer sites and they're shared with uh, not just your doctor, but your insurance company. And so I went ahead, I got curious and took a look at a couple of the apps. Um, ResMed, so the ResMed, ResMed Air Mini uh, APK had at least a code signature in, in it indicating it was talking to Flurry which is kind of an analytics site considered a tracker. So, and Philips Dream Mapper, Dream Mapper, which works with their site, I think they actually had a Philips machine, a Philips CPAP machine at the biohacking village yesterday. And that is talking to Apptentive, which looks, which also looks a lot like a tracker. So those, so those are just the smart mo smartphone apps. So here's how it works. Um, so ProPublica did a very interesting study on um, the CPAP machines. And so there, so what, um, a lot of times when you have insurance, you don't just buy the device outright, you're required to rent it. And the rental cost is a whole lot more than the outright cost of the machine. And then these insurance companies, I don't know if anybody dealt with insurance companies that have these compliance standards that you need to use to get paid. So Medicare initially came up with the idea that they're going to... Um, that you have to use it for uh, four hours, 70% of the nights in any three-day period. And so then the insurance insurers followed suit. And the ProPublica made a case that this compliance monitoring was a tactic to sh ship the uh, cost onto patients. 
Like, for example, um, the, in a story, there's a, the ProPublica reporter needed a new mask, and so he couldn't use his device because he didn't have the mask he needed. So the insurance company refused to pay because they claimed he wasn't meeting his usage standards. So there are some issues with uh, bad faith denials. So um, interestingly enough, some people have gotten into hacking their CPAP machines. Um, it started with something called Sleepyhead, which was uh, written by an open source by an Australian guy named uh, Mark Watkins um, that allows users to read their own CPAP data and and even some of these modified machine settings. And that that project is no longer active. And Oscar is the open source successor. So here's a question. Should an insurer have the right to monitor compliance and deny uh, payments if um, requirements are not met? Like if, the, if they're... Okay, so we're getting like pretty much a universal no. Let's see, so my next question. So would it be ethical for a patient to modify the device and the software to, in, to uh, improve their privacy and um, maybe, maybe uh, circumvent some of the compliance mo monitoring? Okay, yes, uh, okay, we got a no. No, we got two no's. Okay, so we got mostly yeses, but, but a couple of no's. Um, do we got it? Okay, great. Um. Just want to firstly say first up, I actually work for ResMed, one of these companies. So everything we're talking about is fairly US centric in this presentation. We do actually have other regions like uh, the EU and Japan that have very strict privacy requirements. You actually don't need to modify the software. We actually require patient consent to opt in in Europe. The devices do not monitor until the patient gives their consent. And for some of the apps such as Air Mini, there's an app there's a feature in the app that you can say, disable, don't uh, send my data to the cloud. So we're on board with it being ethical for the patient to control their own privacy. And actually, I've been told by somebody else that Resma does a very, very good job with the security of their devices. And, yeah, and I, in fact, like I, read, I actually read your documentation about how you secured your communications, and um, that sounded very good. And then another security researcher who'd looked into it said that you've done an impressive job. So let's say you're, but you're in the US and if you turn off the monitoring, um, your, insur your insurance company can stop, your insurance company can force you to turn on the monitoring. In that case, is it ethical to, me to mess with the device or the code so that it, maybe to say that, so that it just gives, gives your insurance company the compliance data it requires, that it, that it says is required? Okay, maybe yes, maybe no. Any comments? I, I think it's a great question. I, I think it, here we're talking about regulated devices. So there are all kinds of different implications for regulated devices. If it was unregulated, I would answer probably very differently. I think it's, it, it's a more of a gray area and very loose. In regulation, if you play with your pacemaker, for example, and, and affect the, the Bluetooth connectivity to turn it on and off only when you want to, and you end up shorting the unit and it burns you, what happens in that case? Right. So I think there's other implications when you start affecting the code and meta and truly regulated devices, typically because they're in categories in which are life saving or, or they have other um, more serious consequences if you actually affect the code adversely. Oh, yeah, I think that's an, an excellent point. Like, say you want to you want to modify something to increase your privacy. Do you do you maybe inadvertently screw something up or introduce another problem uh, to it? And I have no good answers to that. Um, Oh, I'm sorry. You were, you were no, right? no. I, you were it's to go? great. Yeah. So I think that I think fundamentally there's a difference between what's whether we have an ethical or a moral right to privacy, and whether we have a legal right to privacy. And those are two very different questions. So in the case of highly regulated devices, there's obviously a legal there's legal statutes around that, but that doesn't infringe upon people's ethical right to privacy. Um, so something might be ethical but not legal, um, or you know, unethical but legal. 
Oh yeah, I, th I, I mean, I think that there's definitely a difference between like law and ethics. In, in fact, that, that actually, I mean, that raises some interesting questions because like there's an ongoing um, CPAP hack, hacking project going on called Oscar and it's like, well, um, so you've got somebody, so you've got somebody who is a volunteer open source developer who's trying to help them. Um, are they responsible if what they're doing to try to help causes a problem for the patient? I, I mean, uh, I mean, like, uh, to what extent should they be responsible for that? And that might that might be going into a completely different domain. So let's talk about just the idea of making things better. So there's a few there's a few ideas that occur to me. Um, so. So one thing is maybe increasing some of the legal regulations. Um, an issue with that is that dealing with the uh, government can be a little bit slow. Like for example, um, getting a like getting a device or getting getting some software through FDA approval takes a very long time, and uh, and that's and that can be kind of tough because the product the product de product development cycle and stuff with software can be pretty fast. Um, and then we talked about like do-it-yourself hacks, like you see like an app or something, and you and it it's you it's something that you consider a privacy um, a, a privacy problem. Probably say a lot of people attending DEF CON here would have the skills to do something about it, but that could, that can be a little bit time-consuming and possibly fraught with some other risks. And then another idea would be maybe a voluntary compliance certification program. And so basically, how would that, so it's there's just some open questions about how that might work. So just turning it over to you, um, like so, what what do people think? How could we how could we make the privacy situation better? Oh well, no takers. Uh, I'm not going to strictly say how do we make the privacy situation better, but I do want to pose a related question, which is: Is there a balance between privacy needs and health needs? When we talk about you know the insurers having the ability to see patient data, it feels a bit wrong that they're you know spying on you. But if the ultimate goal is to help the patient, if the patient isn't using their device, it's a good thing if their doctor can call them up on the phone and say, "Hey, you need some help." So are we just saying that like the doctor can see the data, but we're not okay with the insurer? Is it based on whether it's in the patient's interest versus a financial interest? Is that kind of how we're trying to weigh up privacy versus patient health in this scenario? Um, yeah, it's it's a tough situation because like um, like like I think for example when you're talking about a CPAP machine, it, there's a, there are very good reasons for the doctor to be able to see the data. The issue in the U.S. Uh, that the ProPublica article talked about was that there's a there is at least a suspicion that's that um, the insurance being able to see the data is part of a known playbook of trying to uh, in, intentionally trying to shift the cost back onto the the uh, patient. Like for example, in the example the, with the case that the guy needed a new mask and the insurance the insurance company wouldn't pay because he couldn't use a device because he needed a new mask. That was kind of a bad faith denial. And I think the implication of the article was that there are a few more other bad faith denials. So I think it, it's a matter of, I think, the insurance provider being maybe viewed as less trustworthy than the, than the physician. So, wait, oh, I'm sorry. I think a lot of these products, a lot of these health tracking products are free apps, right? And so one way to change the system is to ask people to pay up front for an app that has excellent privacy. And I think the issue there and the reason why we haven't seen more of it is the public is used to ha getting these products for free and not understanding the the consequences or what they're giving away, right? Oh yeah, they, um, I think they have no they mostly have no idea. Yeah, so I think there's a question of if we want these products to be more ethically made, then we need to educate consumers and get them used to paying for the product up front and then expecting security in return. That's, a, that's an excellent point. I mean, like, and, you know, like, I'm guilty myself that I'll, um, that I'll be like, oh, yeah, free app, I'll install this. And it's exactly what you said. Um, and I think it's, it comes back to uh, in, some of the incomprehensible privacy policies, too. Like, technically, there's a privacy policy, but people can't read it. And one of the things that article the article that talked about it said would be interesting is if the privacy policy actually gave gave customers a list of companies that might be buying their data, would that make them think? So it's related to this, um, 
one of the things that um, I, I think about this space is that really the only, the really from a regulatory perspective or a policy perspective, the only thing that will really shift the market is sunshine laws. So requiring companies to um, disclose exactly what they're doing, you know, to whom they're selling the data, for example. Um, that said, and even if even with all of the work um, that's being done to make privacy policies more readable, um, which is my job, um, there's still too many of them for people to read. Um, and so I think that what we need to get to is um, machine readable, digestible privacy policies that then flag, you can set your preferences and then flag for you the sketchy stuff um, where you would be downloading an app and it would, you know, your privacy policy reader would read the privacy policy for you and say, oh, you've agreed to all of these sorts of things before. You're good with this stuff. Here's something that's outside of that norm um, that you wouldn't want to be involved with. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's a really interesting idea because it seems like um, natural language processing has really been getting a lot stronger. Yeah. And the last few years in it and so like 10 years ago I would have thought that was impossible and now I'm like you know that actually that actually could very well be uh, be possible yeah yeah given that one in five Americans can't read at the fifth grade reading level I think that we really need to shift to making adaptive tools just like we make adaptive tools for people with mobility um, issues or or other um, other differences in the way that they interact with the world yeah, I mean, to be very honest, I just uh, having taken a look at some of the privacy policies, um, I cannot imagine like somebody visually impaired trying to cope with that. Yeah, exactly. So the adaptive technology would would benefit not only people with difficulty with, you know, with low reading ability, but people who have low reading ability for myriad other reasons. Yeah. So I, I love the direction of this. Um, I when I've seen patients in clinic, I'm a surgeon by training. When I've oh, seen patients in really clinic, cool. like it's super frustrating that, you know, you have things designed that as a physician, you can't even understand you're having your patients understand. And then you, you extrapolate to the app world for this community, the, the, the kind of extension of that, I'd love to see, especially because you mentioned and, and rightfully so we talk about the number of regulated or unregulated apps and trackers we can name. Multiply that by like a thousand of the homegrown ones that are all out there. And so I, I think a growing um, uh, a thing that a number of, of kind of innovators have talked about is the gatekeeper probably should happen on the app store level. So if you think about applying some of these technologies and actually taking the powers of this larger community, not so much to the app developer, but to the actual gatekeeper before the app can actually get out there. If you look at where they actually have to go in, they all funnel through a single store typically, either on Apple or Android or all these different means. Right now, there's no gatekeeper there to actually say like, you have to meet this bar when you're collecting this level of information and that you have to actually consent or have people actually go through this level of understanding so much. It's somewhat loose, but to be able to kind of firm that up. It's kind of tough because, so when we're talking about um, Android and, and so like Play Store is where you get Android apps. Um, who creates um, Android? Google. Um, what business is like in one of the biggest ad marketing um, <laughs> um, businesses just, of the country? These same people who were created Android and are, are running the Play Store. So, yeah, it's, it's a, I mean, so like what you said was a really good idea. It's just um, it, it it's hard to imagine Google maybe seeing that as being completely in its best interest. Yeah. So when when my organization partnered with Apple to develop um, health research kit, the research app platform for iOS and research stack, which is the analogous platform on um, Android, they fought us tooth and nail about requiring um, informed consent as part of those apps, the research apps. So these are apps specifically designed for research studies, a platform specifically designed to conduct research studies, and they fought us on the requirement for informed consent, and then fought us on the requirement for ethical board review approval. And um, so I don't think, I mean, it's a nice idea, but I don't think there's going to be any traction in the general stores for those. Yeah, I, like so. Um, supposedly the newer version, they are the newer version of Android Q is coming out, and that it's going to be a little bit better with on privacy. But EFF, uh, EFF wrote an article, and I, I believe there are still some shortcomings related to that. I think something that's not really talked about is is the idea of maybe presenting it to the user and giving them an option, right? Um, you can buy this app for five dollars, or we can use your data. Um, actually, that's a really good point because I think 
I, th I think a lot of times um, users think that uh, you, you can spend $5 on this app or you will occasionally be annoyed by ads. They don't think about it in terms of their data. They just think about being annoyed by about having to put up with ads. To do it right, they'd have to list, hey, we're going to share this information, but you know, that, that's probably the harder part is knowing who and what they're sharing. They don't want that information to go out to the, to the consumer, but the idea that you could purchase something or give your data to get that service for free, you're still purchasing it, but that value is, is in that bottom line, right? You're saying, my personal data is worth $5 to this company. But then there, there's the ethical conundrum of a class differentiation, right? So that people with money can yeah. buy privacy and people without money are an exploited class. No, so, that's that's true. That's Absolutely. True. So, or or do is still charge you and use your data. Well, or at least, or at least, make sure people are aware of it. I mean, one of the things that recently came out was Vizio said we couldn't sell smart TVs this cheap uh, if they were if they weren't smart TVs and tracking users' data. So, you know, put that in there somewhere. It says you paid five hundred dollars for this TV. We are giving you a hundred dollar discount because we're tracking your data. Yeah. Just for what it is worth, um, if you have, a, you have an app that's charging you, you're paying them money and they are promising that they're not sharing their data and they actually are, there are some ways to, uh, to catch them doing it. Like, for example, with the period tracker app, um, I set up, uh, uh, I basically set up a bunch of emulators and installed certificates and ran them through um, like an, inter, an intercepting proxy. Uh, to, to see to see who they were talking to and, and often what they were saying and so it's like yeah you can catch you can uh, I, I mean like you have control of the device and there are ways to find out what it what it's doing it, it doesn't mean necessarily everybody will always bother to catch them but they they, they can get caught so and so any, any, any other thoughts I wasn't fast enough when we were talking about HIPAA, but I think it's a generally a pretty misunderstood thing. It's first and foremost for healthcare or health record portability mm -hmm. and the privacy stuff pretty much just falls under how that is taken account uh, taken account for. So it doesn't fall into a lot of things that people just people see health things and they just say HIPAA. Those yeah. things just don't happen. And I, that's just something I didn't learn until I actually worked at a hospital. And I, so I think it's just a, a really big misunderstood thing. One thing that was great with that somebody else raised a, a rather interesting question is that, uh, like for example, if you have a doctor that's maybe encouraging a patient to use a health app, um, does the doctor bear any legal or ethical responsibility for the privacy of the app? Like if, the, if a doctor is encouraging a patient to use an app that's loaded with trackers, uh, does the doctor bear any responsibility for that? I mean, are, are they should the doctor be expected to know or have any responsibility for that? I, and I don't know. So, I mean, on that note, I think that it depends on whether the doctor's getting kickbacks from the company. If there's money coming back from the company because, in, and so he's pushing it, right? Similar to what happens with drug reps, things like that, in, in, a, in a doctor's perspective, if that app company is going to the doctor, it's a question of, you know, really. It, you know, is it is it malicious or not? Malicious is probably the wrong word, but you know, are you are you telling your patients to use this for your own monetary reward? And actually, I believe that there's an online um, database with doctors that will tell you will, will tell you um, how much money a doctor has taken and from who. So it's like there's, I, I mean, like there, there would be a way to look that up, I believe. But it's it's very interesting. I mean, like when I look through records, I, I have not seen any app makers in that. But I guess that's I mean that's a possible scenario that could happen in the future. Okay. Um, and okay, do we have anything else or no? We've talked a lot about systemic change and and different models or approaches to this. But I'm curious to hear what you believe is a first step to making these health tracking apps safer or better? Like, does that, do you see that starting with the companies? Do you see that starting with consumer education? Like, are there any quick wins? I'm thinking, to be honest, um, probably your quickest approach is going to be, your quickest approach is probably going to be consumer ed. I mean, because like right now there, I mean, it's legally unregulated. It's, it, you, you can't really make, um, you can't really make custom, um, 
the uh, app developers do better. One thing, though, that's interesting, though, is that there's been some news coverage. And, like, so, like, these uh, newspapers have investigated some of this, and they've kind of named and shamed the companies. And, um, like, for example, there was a news article about the flow period tracker that was a period tracker that was um, basically sharing a whole lot of user information. And they got some very high-profile news reporting about it, and flow um, significantly cleaned up their app. And at least, if, if nothing else, stopped sharing a bunch of data with Facebook. So I think consumer ed, and to be honest, just continuing to investigate and maybe uh, maybe shame the companies into doing a little better is, practically speaking, the best I can think of. Yeah. Have you seen any evidence that suggests that these app writers and companies that are utilizing this are doing this privacy infringement on the front end, knowing that at some point somebody's going to push back? Well. And they take that risk of let's gain what we can monetarily now, and then we'll clean it up later. Because this is all stuff that it's not rocket science. Mm-hmm. These are things that have been exposed out there for a long time, and yet consumers, and I agree totally, consumers have to be educated. But how often do consumers listen? Um, uh, it varies by consumer, but let's say on average, probably not very often. <laughs> <laughs> And so it's like with a lot of times with software, it was like, especially with apps and stuff, it's like, it seems like they, they, you got a fairly short cycle on them. Like they get developed rapidly and they, uh, and sometimes they can, they can go away rapidly anyhow when the developer gets tired of maintaining them. So yeah, throwing something up and making as much as they can and then just deciding it'll go away when it goes away. Um, yeah, that's very realistic. And especially, it's like when you look at the app developer, you, you're usually not saying an individual's name. You're seeing this company whose name doesn't mean anything to you at all. So, so it's like, um, yeah, I, I think it's very likely. I think the other interesting kind of provocative thing to think about is there's a lot of consolidation happening in this space. And a lot of the managed care companies are actually buying apps to become innovative. Oh, yeah. And they actually then assume the data on many levels. And if the company doesn't have the right protect, uh, protections and or can censor the patients, the question is what's happening to that data? And then is there still a wall between it? Yeah, actually, that's interesting. I think one of the better, I remember reading about one of the better uh, period tracker apps getting acquired that way. So, uh, yeah, I, yeah, I, that sounds very familiar. Oh. We around any other questions? Okay. Thank you.